Mark is seated. Let's all stand. <laughs> Work them knees there. There you go. <laughs> Praise God. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Don't you love that when the preacher gets you up and down? Up and down. Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's uh, let's continue to pray for uh, Dakota Russell, recovering from surgery. Um, the young man that got the uh, wreck on the motorcycle, he has uh, been up out of the uh, induced coma for about four or five days now. Still can't move his limbs and such. Keep on praying for him. But uh, a lot of it, they think, has to do with weakness, just being in the bed for five weeks and comatose, so to speak. And uh, so be praying for him. Let's continue to pray for Brother Joe. Brother Joe has uh, really worked his back working on this floor and cleaning up last Saturday. And so his back is screaming at him. And uh, Sister Patty's styling a, a nasty headache today. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Brother Fox is still recovering. Uh, Sister Hutto, daughter, uh, is going to be having surgery on Monday. She needs our sincerest prayers. Uh, cancer is trying to take over. And uh, Sister Hutto's heart is, is heavy, and our hearts join with her in prayer. Amen. And uh, maybe you have a prayer request that you'd like to give in at this time. Remember Christy? Remember who? Christy. Christy recovering from surgery as well and complications from that. Yes, thank you. Somebody else? Remember my brother Amen. Let's remember him. Anyone else? I have a not a request, but an announcement. Uh, that if you're missing your blanket, they are in the back windows on each side. So. Amen. We did not include the pillows because we didn't want you to go to sleep. No. <laughs> Amen. No, there were no pillows. <laughs> Amen. Tomorrow, sissy, got some tests. X-rays and see what's going on. All right. Somebody else. Unspoken. Yes. Anyone else? Remember all my lost loved ones. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's got a at least one lost loved one. It doesn't have to be a son or daughter or husband. It could be a cousin. Or, we got at least one lost loved one. I do too. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and this is the greatest need is people being saved. But uh, how many knows that God's interested in all of our infirmities? Amen. Whether it's sin or sickness, God's interested. So let's go to God in prayer and ask God to strengthen. Lord, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to come to you uh, just mere humans made from the dust of the earth. God, we're, we're not uh, everything that you desire for us to be, but you're creating in us, Lord, uh, that perfect man and perfect woman that you want us to be. And yet you've given us the opportunity to come to you and call on your name and, and to serve you and to speak with you and to hear from you. So, Father, we need to hear from you for Sister Hutto's daughter. We need to hear God healing. We need to hear your touch. We need to hear, God, that miracle working power in the lives of those that are most in need of these things. And God, we pray for all others, Lord, that are going through difficulties in their bodies and recovering from surgeries. And Lord, those that are facing uh, some tests and such coming up. We need your touch in our lives, and we give you the praise and the honor for being our Savior. And Lord, we also praise you for being our healer and our deliverer, God. And we want to say thank you, Lord, for ministering special needs, lost loved ones, God, reaching out and touching their hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray these things be done. And everybody said, Amen, amen and Amen. Well... You're without Brother Blake for about a month, three to four weeks. And Sister Kayla's fixing the high tail it out of here. And she says she'll be with us about two Sundays over the next 
month or so before she leaves and uh, something like that and then she's going to be going off to get educated and so we're excited for her that she's finally going to get some education in. Amen. And uh, uh, Brother Glenn's going to be missing this Sunday. He's going to be up in Washington, D.C. at a wedding. I'm glad I don't have to travel that far for a wedding. And um, let's see. So anyhow, you're stuck with Brother Petty. Sister Kim's going to be singing this Sunday. She's uh, agreed to do that. And so we're looking for a great time there. Um, and uh, Brother Larry, Larry's going to be with us Sunday, so we'll have a different piano player Sunday. But tonight, you're stuck with me. <laughs> <Hey, man. laughs> That's all right. It's all right. We are, we are proud of the Lord. Amen. How many remember them old redback songs, Are You Washed in the Blood? Huh? At the Cross, At the Cross. How many remembers that one? Uh, fill my way every day. Yeah, remember that one. How about getting ready to leave this world? Oh, yeah. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a melody of those tonight. Won't you just join in? We're primarily going to sing the courses, and uh, maybe you'll remember some. Some will come back to your mind, and we'll do that right there. Uh, offering right after this. All right. Well, Brother Penny's wanting to go down a little bit lower, so I got to. Got to go down here. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, okay. There we go. Was that the emergency signal? <laughs> Get ready. We're going to need help. All right. Y'all sing with us if you will. Well, are you all? Oh, 
you. Look at your neighbor and tell you, you better get ready. You better get ready. Hey, man, you talking about eating. Woo! Me and Brother Joe are going to get around the throne. Offering plate. Thank you, sister. Hey, Amen. Somebody forgot their job. Who was that? Noah's not here. Today. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, he is here. <laughs> oh, all right. What? No, it was Hunter, wasn't it? Uh, thank you, Hunter. I appreciate that, man. He's going to come forward to help receive the offering at this time. Grab your Bibles. Turn to Mark 16, verse 15. Brother Mark, did you know you had a book in the Bible? Yes, sir. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give. We ask you, Lord, that you would bless the giver, that you would bless the offering, that you would put your hand upon each and every one and bless each and every one here tonight, God, with what they have need of in the name of Jesus. Here everybody said, Amen. 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 Aren't they precious? Yeah. Amen. It's got to be a little higher with this thing here. Going lower. All right. Praise God, praise God. Amen. Did I forget something? Are y'all waiting on me? No, I got you. I thought they was telling me I forgot something. Well, it's so good to be a child of God. Hey, man, I've been a child of the Lord so long. Uh, you've been a child of God so long. The devil's gotten so mad, but we haven't turned back, have we? <laughs> hey, man, we've been holding on. Yeah. One fellow I know, he says, you got to hold on. He told me, he said, you, you, yeah. he said, you got to hold on. He said, you remember when you told me that preacher, Petty? Of course, y'all know my memory's not the best in the world. He said, you said, I got to hold on. And uh, that was years later, so he's still holding on. Hey, Amen. Well, glad to have you in the house of the Lord tonight. Now, before we get into our text here in Mark 16, I uh, want to talk to you about, so what do y'all see up here? What is that? The cross. And it's supposed to be a resemblance of the cross that Christ died on, right? To remind us of Christ's sacrifice. And um, what a gift he gave that he laid down his life for us and um, for me, uh, for, a, for a rank sinner, for a no good, somebody who wanted to do things his own way. All right, if you don't mind, go to the next one. I want to, want to tell you in, in Ephesians 6 and 15, it, it, it teaches about the armor of God. It talks about uh, the arm yourself. In other words, with the gospel of peace. That's part of the armor of the Lord. And shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And uh, so why would the gospel of peace have anything to do with the cross? Seem like everybody want peace, right? Go to that next slide, if you will. And uh, and, and but but here we have, uh, uh, so to speak, a resemblance of what Christ went through for us. Why would the gospel see be so offensive? Uh, you, you you talk to somebody who's needing help and. And you try to help them. That's what Jesus said. The Bible said that Jesus went about doing good, right? And so it, it, it's a gospel of goodness. It's a gospel of peace. And, and yet they crucified the Lord. So why then is the gospel so offensive? That's a question uh, for us that, that we're going to have to we're going to have to figure out. Go to the next slide, if you will. This is an introduction into our into our next week. What what is the issue then with people? Why are they Why are they so offended with, with the gospel? Uh, I think it was Calvin was mentioned earlier before church that a lot of churches uh, are, are some ministers have stopped preaching or using the word sin or 
anything that would chase the sinner off, so to speak, uh, that they would find distasteful or uh, they, that they stopped trying to win people to Jesus Christ through repentance. They just trying to get the numbers. What is the issue? Is it, is it uh, that we believe that when you get married, you should stay married if, if there's any way possible? Uh, abortion, addictions, is it homosexuality? Our message against these things, immorality, racial injustice, personal preferences. What, what, is, what is it that causes people to be upset with the gospel of peace? Go to the next slide, if you will. And, uh, and the gospel of offense, understanding why the gospel is hated. We're going to talk about that next Wednesday. And uh, so we want you to, to, to be with us for that and, uh, and be pondering that. Why, why is the gospel so hated? All right, tonight we're going to Mark 16. Thank you, brother. That's all for that uh, slide. I don't have a slide for this. Uh, Mark 16 and 15. The Bible says, go ye into all the world and do what? Preach, Preach the, gospel. the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That's pretty serious. That's for some folks' requirements. That's written in red. And so it's very important. Jesus spoke these words. And so we want to talk tonight again. We want to have a communication tonight, a conversation. Is that all right? We want to have a conversation about um, sharing Jesus, sharing the gospel of Jesus, sharing the word of God, sharing God with other people. And so if you will, would you just join with us in prayer? And we want to begin a conversation uh, about this most important subject. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Thank you for being with us, for forgiving us, saving us, for lifting us, helping us. And even when there's been times that we've fallen down, when we've slipped back into sin, done things we ought not to do, we want to say thank you, Lord, that you heard our humble and honest cry. Please forgive me. Thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. Help us, God, to be able to do more for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. I want to be able, you may be seated, to do more for the Lord. And what that means is um, I need help. Uh, I, I may not be as able now um, as I will be tomorrow should the Lord give me insight? Should he give me wisdom? Should he give me uh, some type of spiritual uh, vigor? Uh, it, 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 it's, we have our ability, but then the Bible says with God, all things are possible. He can help us do whatever is needed to be done, right? And so uh, there, is, there is our natural giftedness, some people are shy. Some people are as bold as you want to like, hey, whoa, just settle down a little bit. And, uh, and, and some people are sort of middle of the road, right? So we're all different, um, uh, different characteristics in us. And nobody, nobody is uh, uh, what we would say better than the other, whether you're outspoken or whether you're real shy and you can't hardly speak. That, that's not the issue. Uh, matter of fact, for those that are bold to speak, the Bible says that the letter, of course, back then they wrote a lot of letters and sent them out, uh, you know, just in general, just in the general population. And they would send letters here and there. The Bible says that the letter kills, but the spirit makes a lot, right? And so it doesn't matter how bold you are, how shy you are, um, whether you're all up in people's faces or whether you're very timid and you can't get out but a word or two, it's not the words that make the difference. It's the spirit that's inside those words that's directing your conversation. Does that make sense? The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of God can take one word and turn a person's life around. We can spend a dictionary trying to tell them why they need to be saved. 
and they still go on in sin. How many, how many realize what I'm saying is the truth? Amen. And so it's very important that we understand that it's through the Spirit. The letter can kill, but the Spirit can make a lie, transform. He can, God can do this through us. So when I say I want to be more able, I want to have more ability, what I'm actually saying is, Lord, teach me, use me, mold me, make me into what I need to be. Is that good? Is that all right? Acts 1 and 8, he tells them again, he says, I want you to go out and I want you to tell them all things that I've told you. I, I want you to go out and do this. You can read it for yourself there in Acts 1 and 8. So witnessing is very important to God, but it's, it's important to God because he loves the sinners. Okay? Why is witnessing important? Because God loves the sinner. Because the sinner will face judgment. Doesn't matter if it's my children or your children. If we sin, and that's how we meet God, it's going to be a terrible time. Okay? So, why does God want us to witness? Because he loves the sinner. He doesn't love the sin, but he loves the sinner. The sinner is so important to God that God sent his only begotten son to be a witness of who he is. Right? Uh, somebody said, what? Well, yeah, God sent his only begotten son to be a witness of the character of God. God in the flesh, God with us. That's, that's Emmanuel. That was one of Jesus' name. God sent his only begotten son that, so that he can witness to the world the heart of God. The heart of God was, I've come to do good. I've come to help. I've come to love. I've come to lift up. I've come to turn around. I, I've come to forgive the demonic that ain't wearing nothing <laughs> but chains that other people put on them. And I, I've come to, to save those who really never done anything that you would classify as wrong, like Paul. Paul said, I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He said, and concerning the law, perfect. Wow. Amen. So Christ came to save him. Now somebody said, yeah, but he was killing Christians. Yeah, but you got to understand. According to the way he understood the law of God, they were, they were idolatrous. They were worshiping a man called Jesus. And they were trying to infiltrate the religion of Judaism. And they were trying to do things that Paul took great, or Saul took great offense to. And he was, he was vigilant for God as he understood it. And so God come to save a man who was very earnest, very earnest for God, but misguided. Okay, is that fair enough? He was, he had the old belief and he refused and rejected Jesus Christ. All right, now, uh, in Acts chapter 17, when, when we're dealing with, uh, how, many, how many finds it difficult to talk to other people that have a, um, a religious faith? How many find it more hard, more difficult to talk to them than to talk to a sinner who's not claiming anything particular? Huh? A sinner who... Uh, you know, they, they don't go to church nowhere. They don't have no particular religious bend, so to speak. Um, they're just sinners. And then trying to talk to somebody, the Jehovah Witness, uh, Mormon, uh, somebody, of another, somebody of a faith that is in error, like Paul was, in error. How many finds it more difficult to talk to a person of a religious uh, tendency than, it, than to just a sinner? And I'm not talking about just talking to them. Hey, I like that car. Oh, that's cool. I'm talking about talking about God with them. I'm talking about sharing and trying to witness to them. Sometimes it is more difficult to try to win somebody who thinks they're right than to try to witness to somebody who knows they're wrong. Does that make sense? Amen. Somebody that knows that they're out of whack but I can't help it. I like it. <laughs> you know, 
than it is to try to witness somebody who believes that they're right. There, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I'm, I'm following uh, the Quran, or I'm following the Book of Mormon, or I'm following the Jehovah Witness translation of the Bible. Be careful not to accidentally get that one. Uh, in, in other words, uh, how many has ever tried to witness to a Jehovah Witness? How'd that go, Peggy Lou? Sister uh, Minnie, was that you? Yeah. It's hard to talk to them. But I mean, like she said, you know, we're wrong. They're right. Yeah. Yeah. So here's Paul, or Saul rather. Saul is being preached to by Stephen. The Bible says Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. I mean, he wasn't half full. He was full of the Holy Ghost. And Stephen was preaching about Jesus Christ and what they did to him as Jews and how that was wrong and how Jesus, Jesus came to save and deliver. And Saul, who would later become Paul, he's listening to this message. And there's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a leader. And he didn't even have to get his hands dirty. People started taking off their coats and putting them in his arms so they could pick up rocks and throw them at Stephen and kill him. A man full of the Holy Ghost, Right? didn't make a dent in, in Saul's uh, heart, in his mind, didn't make a dent of conviction in him. How many has ever witnessed somebody feel like you ain't even making a dent? Huh? Yeah. You're not, you're not getting nowhere. But Saul was riding with a bunch of his fellers down to another place, and they were looking to arrest some sinners, or I mean some Christians. And to him were sinners. And on that way, the Lord came by. And the Lord shone his light upon Saul. And the Lord knocked Saul off his high horse, so to speak. And the Lord began to speak to him. And Saul began to say, who are you, Lord? Who, who are you? I don't know who you are, but you are Lord. I know that much right now. You overtop me. And he said, I'm Jesus who you persecute. And, and sometimes we get discouraged in witnessing and we feel like, what's the use? They're, they're, we're not gaining any ground. We're not doing anything that's making any difference. Please, 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 please. Always resist that temptation to stop doing the work of the Lord and keep on doing it. Keep on witnessing. God's got their number. I believe it was a divine appointment for Saul to be in the presence of Stephen's message and, uh, and to hear him preach that gospel message, even though it didn't turn him. But later on, he said, I was the chief of sinners. Later on, he said, he said, I serve God and am more diligent for the Lord than all the rest of these preachers out here. And I came along late to the game. He said, but I'm, I'm more diligent. He said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was, what, what was it that Saul was so passionate about? He realized the crimes he had committed against Jesus Christ and his church and what he was forgiven of. And I believe the Bible bears the fact that he that's forgiveth, forgiven much loves much. And Saul really, really loved the Lord. Amen. Because he was forgiven a lot. Now, um, when it comes to, to witnessing and motivating uh, yourselves to witness, uh, I have a book up here, a little book I've had for many years. And it, I don't even know if it's in print anymore, but it's called The Soul Winner's Workbook, Drawing the Net. The Soul Winner's Workbook, Drawing the Net. And um, so it's very, very good stuff. You might be able to pull it up out of a used bookstore online or something and order it that way. 
Uh, but uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 31 it tells us that we win souls because it glorifies God. How does it say that, Brother Petty? It says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. Somebody say whatsoever. whatsoever. It says, do all to the glory of God. So I said, how's that tie in? Well, the word all is pretty important. Everything you do, you're not trying to build your church. You're not trying to build uh, your popularity. It's all for God's glory, right? So, so always keep that in mind whenever the devil says, oh, you're just trying to promote yourself. You have to push that devil aside and say, listen, I'm doing this because I love the Lord and the Lord asked me to share the gospel, right? Amen. So... Uh, you have to fight the enemy because he'll either condemn you or, can, or, or try to make you feel guilty even about doing good. All right? Second thing is when we win souls, we rescue sinners from hell in Psalms 9 and 17. The Bible says that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all people who forget God. Now, I don't know of anybody that I want to see go to hell. I don't know of anybody. And our hearts uh, are burdened for those realities. To know that broad is the way that is leading to destruction, and many are going that way. Now, I know that we live in a Christianized generation where everybody's a Christian. Everybody's a Christian. If they're calling on Allah, they're a Christian. If they're calling on uh, all these other gods, Buddha, and Believe in the lies of Confucian, all these other. Well, we're all just really serving the same God. No, we're not. No. If we are, then this God's a big fat liar. Because he said there's no other God. He said, I'll have no other God before me. He said, if you serve me, you're going to keep my commandments. And he wrote them down in his word, right? So either he's a big fat liar or there's no other God beside him. And not everybody's going to make it. Okay? So, third thing. When we win souls, we encourage other Christians. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Paul was telling those that have become new converts that... They fill him with joy because they're believing, serving, living, and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he said, that, that fills me with joy. And uh, I think that's important. Number four, when we win souls, we strengthen the church. Acts 2 and 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as for as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them and bought the and bought and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. Number five, when we win souls, we hasten the return of Jesus Christ. Romans eleven and twenty five, talking about the Jews and says blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In other words, there's a time when God is going to say, this dispensation we call the Gentile dispensation is going to end. And when it ends, uh, the rapture is going to take place. This, this thing, uh, tribulation is going to finally wind down seven years later. And there's going to us be ushered in a mighty new kingdom. Praise God. I'm looking forward to that, Brother Russ. Amen. Now, let's have a little conversation. You ready? What's the hardest thing about witnessing? What's the hardest thing about witnessing? Let's start with this, with this category. What's the hardest thing about witnessing to your family? Getting started. Getting started. Okay. So anything you have to say, 
gets thrown back, all right? They say you judge them. Yeah. Judge them, okay? They say they're, you're judging them. Everything I say, I'm judging Yeah. They look at your past. Look at our past. We're judging. They throw it back. Yeah, they throw stuff in your face you didn't do. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they think you think you know everything. Too. Yeah. Goody two shoes. <laughs> know it all. Who died made you God? Right. <laughs> uh -huh. They really need something. They always come home. Especially when they need prayer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody was telling me that just the other day, uh, that uh, the, the family is estranged, but whenever, whenever the child that's an adult needs prayer or needs something, then, then they come back. What does that tell you? Huh? They immediately call us whenever something's going wrong in their life. And what does that tell you? That they know that we've got some answers for them. If they Amen. Them, if they'll just listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> they, they know that. So, so what does that say? I'm not ready to listen, but I know you're right. I may have found that to be true. Um, what has developed some of the better conversations that y'all have had with your family? How did those conversations develop? Versus, ooh, that wasn't good. Some of the better opportunities to speak about the Lord to them. How did that develop? How was how was how did that how did that conversation get stepped into? I just don't know who. There, but yeah. I don't know who they are, so I'm going to wait until they show up. <laughs> but, I mean, we, that conversation went on for hours, and it, it was exhausting. And I mean, everybody was calm. It was just a nice conversation. Right. Are those conversations helpful? Yes. Are they fruitful? I think it plants a seed. It lets them think, give them something to think about. What's your job? Is it your job to make it produce? Nope. No. Well, hey, wouldn't that be pretty? <laughs> that'd be pretty rough as a farmer, wouldn't it? If, if, if uh, you know, you go out there and you, and you throw the seed, but you don't know whether it's going to come up or not. The odds are most of it ain't going to come up, or 25% of it ain't going to come up, 30%, whatever. Wouldn't that be pretty disheartening? It is disheartening as a Christian as well. When you witness and you tell people about the Lord, especially your family members, because good gracious, I don't know who in the world is two miles that way or three miles that way or whatever mile. I don't know who they are. It's it's hard for me to to have a picture of them unless the Lord revealed it. But those that I know, huh? 
those, those that I know that are lost. Um, and that, that, that weighs on us, especially when they're your children. Now, y'all know I've got it at this moment uh, easy compared to some of y'all. Some of y'all have strained relationships with, with family members. Um, you, you have, there, I've heard of family, not necessarily here, but I've heard of families. I haven't heard from my son in years or whatever it's been, you know, and uh, don't, don't know where they are, don't know if they're alive, don't know if they're dead. And I, I, can't, I can't imagine the weight that some people are underneath because of, of what they're experiencing in their homes or, or their offspring, their children. Because it seems no matter how old my children get, they're still in my heart, right? And so I'm sure they are with y'all as well. Um, sometimes, it, we, okay. So how many is witness to your family members? I, I'm not talking about this week. I'm just, just saying, since you've been saved, how many has tried to encourage them to serve the Lord? Huh? Amen. Most practically everybody, if not everybody, we've all been there and we've all been somewhat frustrated. Here's the thing. Sometimes the devil would like to tell us that it's okay. They say their prayers at night. They're all right. Leave it in God's hands. They're saved. But friends, you can't live in sin and live for him. It, it doesn't work. And the devil has convinced sinners that they are all right, many of them. My granddaddy used to say he's a drunkard. And, and he was a functioning drunkard, but when he got off work, he was hitting that bottle and, uh, or those cans. And I don't know what all he drunk, but Grandpa was like, me and the Lord got it all worked out. And, and all we could do is love them and try to witness to them every now and then. And, and, uh, but he eventually got saved. It, it may have been on his deathbed, but he gave his heart to the Lord. He, he was listening, but he couldn't get it in his heart. Eventually it got in his heart. Amen? And so you just keep throwing the seed out and, and because the Bible says God gives the increase. Some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. Do you really believe that? If you really believe that, to carry you a bag full of the Word of God out every day, the seed, and just every now when, when you when you see the opportunity, sprinkle a little bit here, sprinkle a little bit there, see what God do. Listen, um, the difference in leading a soul and winning a soul to Christ. All right, I sort of like this and and, and want to run through this real quick, and, and then I want to ask you another question. Uh, helping souls to Christ. You do that by uh, supporting missionaries, uh, giving out tracts, um, you know, trying to uh, uh, support a radio, gospel radio or something. Uh, so you can help souls to Christ by helping somebody else keep planting the seeds in areas that you can't reach, you can't get to, this, that, the other. Then there's the bringing souls to Christ. And, and that's by getting the lost into the atmosphere of the gospel. Maybe there's a tent revival. Maybe there's a gospel singing going on. Maybe there's a revival. Maybe just a regular church service. Maybe it's an Easter play. Maybe it's this, that, or the other. You know they won't come to church to hear preaching. Hey, we got a Christmas play, huh? And, and you're saving that one up <laughs> with that individual until you're getting close to Christmas. Now, promise me before you promise anybody else you come to my Christmas play. And they know they're not going to hear preaching because they know what that's about but maybe they'll come see a play all right so you can do that uh that's bringing souls bringing souls to christ leading souls to christ you, you do that by pointing those who are already convicted to him you can sense it you know it god's dealing with them by praying with those who came forward to seek the lord and by giving guidance and scripture to those who already say, but they need to come closer to the Lord. And then there's the winning souls to Christ. And you do that by persuading those that are not interested, that, are, that have not made a decision to serve God. 
And Proverbs 11 and 30 says, He that wins souls is wise. wise. 2 Corinthians 5 and 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In other words, we're witnessing, we persuade people to serve the Lord. Acts 18 and 4, Paul reasoned in the synagogue of the every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Every Sabbath, not that was in certain cities, it wasn't every Sabbath, but in this particular setting it was. And then Luke 14 and 23 says, go out into the highways and into the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. And so we win souls to the Lord by persuading people uh, to serve the Lord. So what does it mean by, by what Jesus says, uh, compel them to come into my house that my house may be full? What does that word compel? Just about. Just about. Amen. Almost forcibly. So what does that, how does, how does, have you ever tried to force somebody to come to church? Uh, what, what the word of God is trying to say, in other words, don't give up. Keep every, every direction you can hit it. Try to keep them in the knowledge that I need you to come to the house of God. I need you to come to the house of God. I'm not talking about calling them, texting them every day. I'm talking about, you know, okay, I'm about to wear this one out. I'm coming at this angle now. Huh? And so you do it that way. Uh, uh, what's the day? Okay. Monday, lightning, thunder. How many remembers that day? Rain. Whoosh, rain came down. Amen. And the spider went up, whatever that story was. Anyhow, uh, so so it was thunder and it was lightning. And, and I had a delivery that, that had come to me. And the fellow was up in the back of his truck. And every time that lightning struck, I say, I say, you ready to meet God? <laughs> he looked around and said, what? I said, you ready to meet God? He said, not right now. <laughs> Amen. And, and I, I used the joking aspect of what he was going through, what we were in, to be able to witness to him. I built from the joking aspect for several minutes and giving it little breaks here and there because we had a big order that we was getting in. And so several breaks here and there until he got to where his hands were free and his mind was focused. And then I started dealing with him more severe, more sincerely about Jesus Christ and about making sure your soul is right with God. I told him when the lightning was flashing, so I said, if he wants you, he can get you. <laughs> I said, he's a good aim. <laughs> Amen. He is. How many knows that? God's a good aim. If he wants to call you home, it's not, he's not going to hit Mark instead of you. He's going to hit you. You going. I don't care if an airplane's plowing through here. If you're the one he's after, come on. He'll call you out. So God, God's good aim. So I used that and dealing with him and talking with him, my time was limited because his time was limited. My time was free to win a soul to Christ, but his time was limited. And so I had to stay within a certain bracket of time uh, uh, when I knew that, that things were finished because he had another uh, partner with him that was helping. When I knew things were winding down, you know, I had, I had, to, get, had to bring it on down. It's your responsibility. My soul, David said, is continually in my hand. You're responsible for your soul. What are you going to do with it? He told me in the midst of talking to him, he said, you should have been at my school. He went to a Christian school. He said, you should have been at my school. He wasn't but about 21, 22. And uh, I didn't delve into what he was trying to say there. But God was doing uh, another individual I met with this, this week, a uh, uh, state official that, uh, that I met with this week, working for the government. And she came and uh, did what she was going to do in her official status. And uh, so we struck up, I struck up conversation because 
here's an opportunity. And conversation, because of something she said about her finances, uh, you know, here's a conversation. So we broke into finances, all right? So we're talking finances. That's fine. We can get to God a lot of different ways. <laughs> it's all going to come through Jesus, but what we're talking down here, it can go through a lot of different conversations. So we're talking finances, she's talking her child, she's talking life, and I mean, God's just, God's just opening her up, and, and we're just talking about things, I give her some advice about some things, I uh, point her in certain directions, she's writing things down, and, and uh, with finances and, and, and business and such, and, and, uh, and uh, then I'm, I'm fixing to leave, I'm fixing to walk away. I'm actually acting like I'm fixing to walk away. And I, let me tell you one more thing. I said the most important thing in life. Do you know what it is? She's looking at me. I pointed my hand towards heaven. I said having a right relationship with God. Amen. And then I be, began to deal with her about God. I helped her with her concerns. And then I was able to break into conversation about God. I helped her with what she needed. Now she's ready to listen about another concern of mine because she knows that I care for, I don't even know you, <laughs> but I care for you. And so I began to talk about God and, and and convince her of the need to serve the Lord. She was raised Catholic. She's attending uh, Baptist Church now, and uh, she's a dating a Catholic, and and uh, and uh, she, as I'm talking to her about God and about, uh, you know, I, I said I've been married 35 years. I said me and the wife been faithful to each other for 35 years. And uh, I said, I give God all the praise for all the blessings. And, and, and I said, but you know, uh, being married to my wife for 35 years and uh, being faithful, that's not good enough for my wife. That's not really what she needs, even though she needs those things. I said, what she really wants me to do is to seek after her, pursue her. To let her know my heart is after you, right? And I said, it's the same thing with God. You see, how witnessing is, is important not to beat people over the head, but to find them where they're at, whether it's a lightning storm, whether it's a divorce situation, a financial stress situation. And it's important to understand that you're concerned for the person that they understand that. And so when they understand that you're concerned about their everyday needs, it's, it's easier to come in with the concern from the spiritual aspect. And when you talk to them spiritually, you've got to bring in the carnal life, this life, as I did with me and my wife. You know, we've been married, we've been faithful, but that's not good enough. And I said, it's the same thing with God. You can say you love God. You can say you're a Christian. But that's not really all that God needs. God wants you to seek after him. Now, uh, let me ask this question. <clears throat> How do you break into witnessing to strangers? Somebody toss it up. How do you break into witnessing your last experience? How did you break into a stranger? Uh huh. How far do you go with the conversation? Uh huh. Uh huh. Amen. You only go as far as you feel is helping the person, that, that they're receiving it. And once you get to a place 
to where either you know their time constraints, if you're sitting in somebody's office and you're there, that they're the one that it's their office and they've got you there for a reason, you can't stay in that office for so long before they might get in trouble by their superiors. And But you find if, if God allows you to perceive here's an opportunity, you find that opportunity to begin to witness to them and to begin to talk to them, but don't overstay what, what, it, what you should. I don't know the proper way to say that. Uh, in other words, you can, you can make it a worse situation than, than a better situation. And so just drop the witness, and if the time constraint says you've got to go, you might offer a little prayer. I did not offer prayer with the boy in the lightning storm. I did offer prayer with the official, and she was already boo-hooing and crying. And, and uh, so I said, would you, would you mind if we had prayer? And so we prayed and asked the Lord to touch and help, and amen. But you don't always have that, but you've got to be sensitive to the Lord, and you've got to be sensitive to that individual, and you've got to be sensitive to your setting. And, but you cannot not carry this thing. Now, two, two Wednesdays ago, I challenged you to witness to somebody over the course of the remainder of that week. I don't know if your memory's kicking in or not, but I'm just proud of me for remembering that. But anyhow, <laughs> but how many has witnessed to somebody in the past two weeks? That, that, that'll put it in there. Got one here, somebody else. That doesn't mean you spilt the whole gospel, but you... Even if, even if the Lord allowed you to a sinner to say, hasn't God really given us a beautiful day? That's a witness. That's a witness. Has, how many others have witnessed to somebody? Because sometimes that's all that God will allow you or that time or whatever permits you. How many has witnessed to somebody over the past two weeks? Amen. Another, 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 another. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. That's what it takes. It, 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 it takes that for you to build up your confidence to witness to others. And, um, and so do that often as you're able to. Every opportunity, every individual you meet, if there's some time available, is an opportunity to witness. Doesn't have to be long drawn out. It can be simple. Did you know the Lord loves you? Jesus loves you. They may not have anybody that loves them. And you're walking away from the cashier, leaving her or him with that message. And it can do more for a soul than a 30, 40 minute message. Huh? You are preachers. You know what preaching is? Speaking the good news. It's proclaiming. That's what it is. It's speaking the good news. And so in, in, in closing tonight, what's your greatest challenge in witnessing, just in general? Popcorn, anybody? Greatest challenge. You wanted to witness, but you didn't. What was the reason? Whenever that was. Fuel. Everything in you doesn't want to talk out loud to certain people. Uh -huh. <laughs> Even if they're a stranger. Well, what was it? You, you felt you should talk, but you didn't. What, what was the reason? You felt you should let them know a little something about the Lord, but you didn't. Why? why? Can you remember that time? Mm, not right off. Marie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've had that happen too, where I felt like, and then yeah. I'm like, 
Where'd that go? <laughs> yeah, I have to. Uh, somebody else. Richard. Did you feel like you should have went further, but you didn't? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Why didn't you? Do you remember? No, but I beat myself up after. Yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. I beat myself up those times yeah, as well. Where I feel inadequate. Inadequate? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? What was the reason that hadn't been mentioned, actually? It, it was, But it was, huh? Amen. Most of the people that I've helped win to the Lord outside the church, um, we really didn't deal a whole lot with their sin. You know, you ought to stop or you ought not to. We really didn't deal a whole lot with that. We mostly dealt with the love of God, the need for God, huh? Uh, and and, uh, and how that God can actually transform your life here and have a home for you in glory. Uh, my last story to you is uh, one of Michelle's oncologists. Uh, uh, he come in, y'all remember when she had the, the third degree or third degree burns, I think I called it, and uh, from the chemo right after she started chemo. And uh, after she started healing up some, the doctor, she finally got to see the, the, the oncologist. I think I've got the right one. Anyhow, he come in the office with about three uh, assistants with him and uh, he looked at her he said you scared the H out of me <laughs> I didn't miss a beat I said doc I said you ought not to have it in you <laughs> and he stopped and looked at me I, I kid you not he stopped and looked at me and then he went on about his bed it was about three four or five seconds he's just looking at me and what did he say I didn't hear what you said he, he said that she scared the H out of him. And I said, you ought not to have it in you. <laughs> and he paused for several seconds, just dumbfounded, just looking at me. And, you know, it weren't, uh, during her problem, during, during Shell's uh, chemo, and, and, and uh, it weren't, but just about another, another month, and he went out on uh, sick leave or whatever it was, he, he started having problems. And I've not yet had a chance to revisit what he has in him. But, <laughs> but, but uh, cancer is a hidden killer. And I will probably, I don't know, should the Lord allow me, I'll probably deal with him about cancer. That's his context. Probably deal with him about cancer and how it's a hidden thing. But after a while, it can take you out and liken that to see him and not serve the Lord. But you pray for me uh, to witness to him in a way that he can grab it and, and run with it. You love the Lord? Yes. Was, was it okay tonight to talk? Yes. 
just to talk? Okay. All right, let's, let's stand together. We're going to deal with this offensive gospel. What a nasty thing. <laughs> the offensive gospel next, next, next Wednesday and, and why, why people hate us, the gospel, so much. Amen. Father, Lord, we thank you for saving us, for keeping us, for delivering us. All of us are a little different. You know that. And all of us need help in areas that may differ one from another. But God, you called all of us to be a witness. So Lord, help us to realize that if it's just one word, if we give it, feeling like we should, Lord, you can take it and you can work miracles out of it. We pray that you'll anoint our lips to be ready to speak, ready to answer, ready to lead, ready to guide, ready to help somebody to you. Father, we pray that you'll touch us in this way and make us so winners, Lord. Uh, even if we don't always see the fruit, maybe that person's traveled up the road somewhere. But God, use us to win the lost. In Jesus' name we pray.